Go now to your next set there in your notes, looking at the figures of speech. What's, uh, what page is this? Page 20, is that right? Tama ba page 20? Figures of speech. O, mali ata yung page number ko dyan. Tama ba? Oh, 20, that's right. Okay, let's look at the uh, figures of uh, speech. We have included there 15, at least 15. There are more than 15 in the Bible. But then the most commonly used figurative language in the Bible. Remember our first gear? Tell me, recipe. Number one, first gear. Understand the Bible? Grammatically. Ibig sabihin, understand it? Literally. But friends, there are some verses in the Bible, if you take them literally, you'll have a problem. The Bible says, if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. If we take that literally, how many of us here will still have hands today? No more. All right? And so here are the figures of speech. Look at these examples and then tell me what figure of speech is being used here. Look into your uh, listing there, 15. Choose one. Shout for joy, O heavens. Rejoice, O earth. Burst into song, O mountains. Tell me. All right? That's personification because it's asking the heavens to shout the earth to rejoice, and then the mountains to sing. And that's personification. So that's not literal, that's a figurative language. So making, giving animation to inanimate objects. How about this one? Look to the Lord and His strength, seek His face always. Now does the Lord have, does He have a face? Anthropomorphism. You know, we assign physical human characteristics to God just to understand God. We say that the eyes of the Lord, but actually, does the Lord need eyes to see? He doesn't need eyes. But that's the way we understand seeing is with the eyes. That's anthropomorphism. And then how, how about this one? Under whose wings you have come to take refuge. The Lord has wings. That's zoomorphism. Zoomorphism. So these are animal characteristics that we attribute to God. You know, one time I was, I was watching this program of uh, Soriano. Itanong mo kay Soriano. And I don't know, out of the blue, somebody asked the question, may puwet ba ang Panginoon? Can you imagine? People asking that, even that question, may puwet ba ang Panginoon? Eh sabi ni Soriano, basa! Nung binasa, at siya ay naupo sa trono. Naupo, hindi may puwet. <laughs> oh nga naman. Oh, oh nga naman ano. But again, this is just a figurative language. He doesn't have to have bottom, you know, to uh, be able to sit down. John 21, 25. Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. Oh, exaggeration. Yan. Impossible. Mo. Even the whole world. That's just an exa exaggeration. You know, that's a figurative language. And then how about this one? Z Jeremiah 18, 18b. Let's attack him with our tongues. You know, the enemies of Jeremiah said, let's attack him with our tongues. Anong, anong, ano yan? Kasi pag literal yan, ano yan? Dilaan natin siya hanggang mamatay. You know? <laughs> Namatay sa kiliti eh. Let's attack him with our tongues. Anong tawag dyan? Huh? Ha? Look at the definition of uh, metonymy. Look at the definition of metonymy. So this is substituting of one word for another. So instead of saying, you know, let's character assassinate him, siraan natin siya ng puri, let's attack him with our tongues. So uh, uh, that, that's what it is saying. It's almost related to, uh, ano pa yung isa dyan? It's almost related to uh, another word, uh, another, uh, yeah, this one, euphemism. Look at euphemism. All right? Changing of uh, offensive to inoffensive words. Kagaya ng uh, when it says, and Adam knew his wife. Adam knew his wife. What does that mean, Adam knew his wife? Adam had sex with his wife, but it's, you know, it's an offensive word, so they change the word sex with new. Adam knew his wife. That's euphemistic uh, expression. So uh, almost the same as, the same as metonymy. Okay, let's look at figuring out the figurative, page 21. Just a few here, just to uh, highlight a few. Number one, use the literal sense unless there is some good reason not to. Like uh, Luke 9, 60, Jesus Christ said, Let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. 
Now, obviously, that cannot be literal because patay na nga sila pa maglilibing sa patay. But uh, this is a play of words. Let the spiritually dead bury the physically dead. But you who spiritually alive, go and proclaim the kingdom of God to reach out to those who are spiritually dead. So the, the, the play of words there, and uh, so that's, that's not literal, but a play of words, figurative language. And then look at number three. Use the figurative sense if a literal meaning is impossible or absurd. Like what we mentioned a while ago, if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. So again, you know, it's not the right hand that's the problem. The problem is the heart. And uh, this is just an expression that means you have to take sin seriously. It's like cutting off your own hand. You know, some measures have to be taken in order to prevent sin. Some serious measures. And uh, right now, the right hand is the problem because we can use the mouse and go to pornographic websites. Friends, if you have problem controlling your mouse, don't cut, your, cut off your hand, cut off your internet connection instead. That would be a better application. Or you can put a verse on top of your monitor and then write there the verse, as for me and my mouse, we will serve the Lord. You know? <laughs> At least, medyo, medyo makokonsensya ka ng konti. All right? Medyo makokonsensya ka ng konti. And then, uh, number four, use the figurative sense if a literal meaning would involve something immoral. And so like the Lord Jesus Christ said in John 60 verse 53, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood, you have no life in you. Again, clearly, that's not a cannibalistic, cannibalistic practice. And uh, he's talking about here, uh, again, later on, we know that uh, the Lord Jesus Christ offered His own flesh and blood to save us from our sins. And to remember that, we have the broken body and the, uh, uh, the cup to remember. But for many centuries, or for, many, or for hundreds of years, Christians have been accused of uh, cannibalism because of this verse. And you know what? John 666, 666 of John, the disciples left him because of this teaching. Many of the disciples left him. That's the 666. John 666. Many left him because of this teaching. Now, how about prophecy? <clears throat> no, just very quickly, again, we don't have time to go through uh, examples here, but just the general principles. When you're interpreting prophecy, page 24, number one, it says there, follow the normal principles of the hermeneutical system known as historical, grammatical, literary interpretation. What do, call, what do we call this? Lower criticism against higher criticism. So this lower criticism, we just approach the Bible historically, grammatically, and literarily. Number two, take words of prophecy in their normal grammatical sense. You know, just because it's a prophetic utterance, you don't immediately go to symbolism. Just take it first, literally. That's the first approach. And that's why Micah, when he gave this prophecy, but you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel. So what is this prophecy about? The birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. It will be in Bethlehem, and he was very specific. Which Bethlehem? Because there were three Bethlehems at the time. It's Bethlehem in Ephrathah. And so you don't, you know, it's just clear, straight reading. You don't have to make some, you know, acrobatic uh, explanations. Like one pastor said, you know the reason why the Lord Jesus Christ was born in Bethlehem? Because Bethlehem in Hebrew means house of bread. And Jesus Christ claimed to be the bread of life, and that's why he was born in the house of bread. Wow! So, naman. Again, we don't have to go through that kind of uh, acrobatic explanation. Just straight reading, you know, that's the prophecy. Number three, Consider the literary element which recognizes place of figurative and symbolic language. Now, definitely, because this is prophetic, people are looking into the future and they, have to, they need to find a way how to describe what's happening in the future in symbolic terms. And so, definitely, there will be symbolism. Like in the book of Revelation, the woman would be Israel in chapter 12 of Revelation. Bread would be the word of God. Clothing would be the character. Son of man, of course, is a title for the Lord Jesus Christ. There's another woman there which will be the church, but in chapter 12, it's Israel. And then number four, 
view prophecy as focusing primarily on the Messiah and the establishing of His reign. So primarily, the prophecies in the Bible is about the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know the ratio between the first coming prophecies and the second coming prophecies, the ratio is 1 is to 8. That means for every prophecy on the first coming, there are 8 prophecies on the second coming. So if you're sure He came here the first time, you can be 8 times more sure that He's coming the second time. All right? So like in the uh, Bible, over 300 Old Testament prophecies regarding the Messiah were perfectly fulfilled, more than 300 the time of his birth, you know, the birth of a, a born of a virgin, place of his birth, type of ministry, events of his betrayal, even the manner of execution. You know, his hands will be pierced in the, in the book of Psalms, in, in Isaiah. They, that was even before the invention of crucifixion. It was already uh, determined the manner of his, uh, of his execution, resurrection and ascension. Number five, recognize the principle of foreshortening. So what's this foreshortening? What happens here is the prophet at times would have a revelation of a pro prophetic uh, utterance from God. You know, they would receive a vision and they would think that this would be fulfilled in just one event. But actually, there's two events or three at times. So foreshortening, for example... Isaiah 9, 6. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. Now tell me, this prophecy fulfilled or not yet fulfilled? Fulfilled already or not yet? It's both. So it's fulfilled already. It's like the prophet Isaiah. He thought it's just one event, looking at these mountain peaks, from a distance, it, it looks like just one mountain peak, but actually, there's a first mountain there, which he did not see that there's a valley here before the next peak right there. So the first event that got fulfilled, the child is born, that's the first coming, but the government will be on his shoulders, that's the millennial reign of Christ that is still to be fulfilled. All right? So we're now awaiting the rapture, the seven years of tribulation before the second coming of Christ and then the millennial reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. The government will be on his shoulders and that's what you call for shortening. For shortening. Okay, so there's a cross right there at the valley before the fulfillment of the second part of this prophecy. For shortening. And then of course, number six, look for God's built-in interpretations. You know, the thing about prophecy, you don't have to... You don't have to invent outside the Bible. It's within the Bible, the interpretation of these symbols. For example, in the book of Revelation, it says there, and the one who sat there had the appearance of Jasper. And so you begin to think, what is Jasper? How do, how do you interpret this Jasper? Well, you don't have to uh, look very far. You can look within the book of Revelation. This is Revelation 4 verse 3, but in Revelation chapter 21 verse 11, it says there, it's shown with the glory of God and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. And so jasper here would be like a, like a, a diamond, you know, with its brilliance. And so this one sitting on the throne is so brilliant, the, the, the perfection of his brilliance of this one sitting on the throne. Again, this is a description of the Lord Jesus Christ, but not only jasper, because it talks there, jasper and ruby. Or in another translation, it's sardius. What's the color of ruby? That's red. And so there's the brilliance of jasper, and then there's the blood red ruby. Again, the, 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 the symbolism here for the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that can be an interpretation. But if you know the Old Testament, you can have a, a deeper understanding of jasper and ruby describing this person who is seated on the throne in heaven when John was taken up there. Because we know in the Old Testament, the high priest would, would have a breastplate of the 12 stones uh, describing the, uh, ascribing the 12 tribes of Israel. But very interesting, the first stone and the last stone, the first stone is Sardius, which is ruby and red, and it, it symbolizes, uh, it represents Reuben, behold the sun, and then the last stone is Jasper, which... Uh, uh, represents Benjamin, and it means son of my right hand. So this person who's sitting on the throne, no question about it, behold the son, behold the son of my right hand. This is the Lord Jesus Christ himself who is seated on the throne. So again, that's the, that, that's the way we can interpret 
uh, you know, this um, symbolism. We need to have a knowledge of the Old Testament in order for us to have a better grasp of the New Testament. And then, compare parallel passages. When you study prophecy, you know, the book of Revelation is a, an upgrade of the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel is explained in detail in the book of Revelation. And so, uh, Zechariah and the other prophetic books, like uh, out of the 404 verses in the book of Revelation, 206 are referencing other passages in, of Scripture, particularly the Old Testament. And we have here a one-to-one -one correspondence, for example, of Daniel 7 and Revelation 13. Look at that. It talks about the lion, dito, lion, then bear, leopard, dragon, ten horns, mouth, war on the saints, overcomes them, three and a half years, and 42 months, which is three and a half years. And so there, uh, Daniel talks about these uh, this, uh, beasts and uh, described also in the book of Revelation and, uh, you know, representing these kingdoms, Babylon, Middle Persia, Greece, and then Rome. All right. And then number eight, look for prophecies that are fulfilled and prophecies that are yet to be fulfilled. So we've said Isaiah 9.6 is both fulfilled and not fulfilled yet. Child is born, fulfilled already. The government will be on his shoulders to be fulfilled. Again, you know, when I talk like this, I'm making an assumption already. This, my bias right here is coming out that I'm pre-trib, pre-millennial uh, position. So that's, that's the thing here. Now, I know that some people, they want to go through the tribulation seven years. Um, I mean, what can I say? Good luck. <laughs> but uh, again, no one in his right mind would want to go through the seven years of tribulation. But you see, the main error here, if I may just uh, justify what my position here, is that God's plan for the church is separate from God's plan for Israel. And that's why the, the 70th prophecy of Daniel, it's, it ended at 69th week. The Messiah was killed. The temple was destroyed in 70 AD. And before the 69th week can resume the 70th week, which is already the plan of God for Israel, something has to happen in between. And this is the mystery that 1 Corinthians 15 is talking about the mystery of the church and then the mystery of the rapture of the church. The plan of God for the church, the bride of Christ has to be taken out first before God can resume the 70th week and then go back to Israel. So right now, we are in that, in that uh, between, the 60, between the 69th and the 70th week. And so this 2,000 years already that has passed, we are in that. And so uh, that's... Uh, that's one of the reasons why we believe in premillennial or pre-trib position. Okay, praise God.